I'm very happy to be here with Karina Robinson, CEO of Robinson Humbro in London. And uh, thank you, for Karina, for taking the time for this little interview, because obviously the Global Female Leaders community is very interested, um, partly obviously also anxious to find out um, what, what is happening in the UK, what do we have to expect. Um, now, since uh, a few days, we have a deal on the table and uh, between the UK and the EU. Um, from your perspective, where are the biggest issues um, currently for the UK with this deal that we have on the table? The deal we have on the table is a problem because it basically means the UK gives up control even more to the European Union in order to have access to some of the European Union markets. Now, the truth is, this was, you know, it was always going to be something similar, but the Brexiteers have not been honest with the people with the UK population and told them this. So for many business people at this point, it's let's just get on with it. We don't like the deal, but let's do it because um, uncertainty has been the most difficult thing to cope with. Um, in fact, the um, firms, companies, are at their gloomiest mood for more, almost a decade, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And they've, um, they have not been investing. And the balance of firms expecting activity to rise in the next 12 months is only 32%, um, which, is, which is quite believable. Now, the problem is this deal, it doesn't do what the Brexiteers want, and it doesn't do what the Remainers want. So the chances are it will probably, as we stand now, and of course, you know, in this whole Brexit thing, one has no, nobody predict what might happen. There's so many yeah. unexpected factors. The chances are this deal will not make it through Parliament. And we must remember that it has to make it through Parliament to actually then be taken forward. I don't quite see how it could happen. So what we're looking at, it's either this deal or no deal and some sort of a postponement of the exit date or an extension of the transition time. And I think the chances of that happening are probably larger than they were before this deal was on the table. So this is <clears throat> maybe um, what you would describe as the likely scenarios from here going forward. Yeah, the likely scenarios, I mean, there's the possibility of it going through, which I think is unlikely. There is the no deal, and I think the no deal will not be as bad as some commentators seem to assume. A no deal leaves us more or less where we started. Um, and there will be, I think, a bit of there's a bit more realism on both sides, and the willingness to maybe put this off a bit longer, with the possibility, which people are starting to talk about much more, of some sort of a referendum. Again, now that it's become obvious that that is the best deal that uh, could be could be achieved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um you also see as a third way that there might be a new referendum. Um, I'm, I'm just curious because you mentioned um, a no deal would be, um, I don't know exactly how you put it, but where you were, which um, I guess to the understanding that the Brexit happens, so um, the UK has left the European, uh, European Union, but just with no... Um, other um, alternative regulations in place is is not really what you can describe as that it leaves the situation as it was before, ex ante. Yeah. Or did I get but this is, wrong? I mean, there is this panicky, and they're doing this obviously on purpose. Um, if we don't accept this deal, then there's no deal, and then medicines won't be able to import, you know, will be, not be imported into the UK. For example, insulin is not made in this country. Diabetics will die. You know, it is 
what they called, in a way, this project fear. It mm-hmm. is trying to strike fear into making people just say, well, the best we can do is this deal, let's say yes. I actually think there will be some, or there could well be, one doesn't dare say there will be, there could well be some sort of postponement, um, postponement of the whole exit. Now, obviously, you wouldn't really need to speak to lawyers about this, but I think there is some possibility and there's also a possibility of this transition, which we talk about. The transition is meant to be, um, well, I think actually reasonably short. It's really meant to be from the 29th of March next year to the end of December 2020. There is no way any sort of a long-term deal can be agreed by then. So some of the um, some of the ministers, and I think it was actually Michel Barnier mentioned that there was, you know, the transition period should be extended by two years to allow more time for talks aimed at, a, at an agreement. But that is something that Mrs. May and her Brexiteers, the Brexiteers of the party, won't probably want her to do because they assume it'll then mean we don't really leave the EU in the same way. Mm-hmm. So that would be, <clears throat> could be um, a scenario, um, you think, for um, if the deal that's on the table doesn't go through Parliament, then that would be the alternative to prolong? Or you think that would be even discussed um, before the deal is voted, um, you know, is being put to vote I'm in not Parliament? I'm sure of the order. We'll have to, you know, we'll have to see what yeah. happens at okay. this point. What if if there is, um, as there is talk right now, of a no confidence vote? Um, how likely do you think this this scenario is? Firstly, of the forty eight coming together, and then um, secondly, really um, having um, a majority vote on this, or having the sufficient number of um, uh, members of parliament to to really enact it. Never say never, but to have, as you said, 48%, which is 15% of the parliament, of the parliamentary members of the Conservative Party, they're having problems, some of those who would like to organize this, having a lot of problems to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise they would have been, they would already have put this through. They keep on saying, oh, we've got 48, you know, but some haven't put their letters through. Well... You know, anybody who hasn't put their letters through is probably because they're not going to. So I would have grave doubts that this no-confidence measure is actually going to happen, because even the most extreme Brexiteer, I'm sure, would be aware that, you know, who exactly is going to end up in Theresa May's shoes, nobody really wants the job. It is a job that nobody will thank you for. No. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know... I'm not entirely sure who would actually take it on. Okay, yeah. Um, we definitely <coughs> have a point there. And um, I think what would be also um, really interesting to um, to go to through, you know, also as a scenario, um, because it's also one of the most difficult points, um, I guess, even though there are just um, really a number of difficult points in the in the deal and the, obviously the whole negotiation. But the Irish border is is definitely um, a very touchy issue. Um, what in in your mind would happen if there is really um, no deal, uh, so no understanding of um, how uh, the EU and the UK would interact. What would happen to the border? Well, already um, this morning, and we're speaking here on the 20th, on Tuesday, the 20th of November, this morning the DUP, which are the Mm -hmm. um, Ulster Unionists who support this minority government, the Conservative minority government, they... They put a shot across the bows of the Conservatives. So what they did is a warning by not voting through um, a finance bill that had nothing to do, that was not that relevant to Brexit, 
but they basically did not support it as a way of saying to this government, you know, we must be the most important thing that you're looking at right now. You cannot leave us out um, in any way. And it's obviously it's also incredibly important for Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. Um, I think that's going to be it's a it's a very difficult thing. The one one of the few successes in terms of peace in the world in the last forty years was the fact that you have peace between Northern and Southern Ireland. The IRA is just not there anymore. That is incredibly important. And I think that is something that everybody's gonna do their utmost to save. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think just in practical terms, one is not sure how, um, you know, this will be achieved, um, you know, if, if you really put up a hard border, um, because I think what everybody wants in their hearts and minds is quite clear, but how to practically um, arrive at it um, seems quite blurry. Yes, it, it is. But... Um Then again, if we have some sort of a, a, a longer transition and um, another referendum, things may change. I mean, the worry with another referendum is that the majority, although the opinion polls say there's more of a majority for Remain now, opinion polls, as we know, cannot always be counted on. Mm -hmm. And if, let's say, the result is still... Oh. Um, reasonably close, it would mean that Brexiteers would not accept that they had lost. So, you know, any scenario you look at is a very, very complicated one. And you've also got the fact that, I mean, two facts. One is that the people who, who voted for Brexit because of other reasons, economically they're being left behind, or their children will not have a better life than they do, who are basically attacking the financial and political establishment, they would still vote for Brexit because it's still seen as the anti-establishment move. And this is also, for Europe, it's incredibly worrisome because if you look at most European countries, except for a few exceptions like Spain, Slovenia, Slovenia and the Baltic states, there is a lot of anti-EU feeling there too. And again, it's not based on any facts, It's based on other problems populations are going through at this time of low growth. Um, and it means that for the European Union as a whole, Brexit cannot be an easy deal that leaves the UK with any advantages. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about you know this third way? Because it sounds like you're also saying... Um, For some some issues, there is really um, very difficult with uh, or no um, solution really inside, and uh, maybe we need a new referendum. But then the question is, does it make sense to just put the same question to the people again, or um, how do you think about this? You know, this movement from Gina Miller who says remain and reform. So um, I think uh, the question really is, um, what Uh, what really needs to be different. And there is obviously, as you stated, a, a wider debate, which is uh, in fact necessary for the entire EU. But, you know, for the sake of, of um, this interview, I think um, and time we should limit it to, to the UK. Um, what would be the main issues? I mean, even if people are looking at things they are frustrated about that don't really in the core have to do with the EU. Um, but if we manage to put on a wider discussion and try to have an educated discussion on what really would need to be reformed for the UK to you know, come to the conclusion it does make more sense to stay in, but in a different version of the EU, let's say. Is that anything... Um, you think would be achievable and what would the core of this um, discussion would need to turn around? I think um, the EU is not going to reform in order to help the UK. I think um, 
you know, when David Cameron went across before the referendum and he asked, um, in Brussels, he asked, and he outlined um, Angela Merkel for something to do with immigration. He, he should have been given some sort of a sop, um, some sort of a, some sort of an agreement to help um, because immigration was a major issue here. Now, it's the perception of immigration rather than the actual immigration mm -hmm. because at the moment we're facing huge, um, huge gaps in terms of workers in the UK. In fact, the um, tech industry in London has 48,000 vacancies it can't fill. That's 48,000. Because we've been, the tone coming from the British government has been very unfriendly and the pound has fallen. So there are a number of reasons why people wouldn't be coming here anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think the idea of reform, you, know, you have to be in a club to help it reform. I think Macron realizes it needs to reform. I think, unfortunately, Germany, right now, nothing much is going to be happening in Germany politically for a while because Angela Merkel is going to be in power for, one assumes, another two years in a coalition that will do nothing. So you cannot have reform unless you have both France and Germany on board. Um, recently, there was some reform done, but that was about the euro area. I think the reality is, you know, reform has to happen, but that's not what people are really focused on. They can say it, but that's just an excuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think um, that's that's um, a bit of a gloomy outlook, um, but um, obviously not, not totally unrealistic. Um, as uh, things are moving quite slow um, that's that's for sure and this is a absolute correct estimation um, i think um, i'm i thank you again karina for for this um, you know for this insight in what is the current situation um, as you already mentioned it's it's hard to foresee really because things um, change on the political landscape and around brexit on a on a daily um, on a daily note and um, therefore I'm also grateful that you were ready to talk about it today um, and um, so for the global female leaders uh, in 2019 where do you think we will be in May when we come together next time as a final wrap up one of our last um, global female leaders meetings we talked about working in a world where uncertainty was the predominant theme. And I think uncertainty will continue to be the predominant theme for the next year. I would hope that when we come together in May 2019, we will be in some sort of an extended transition, potentially leading to a new referendum. Okay, well, so we're leaving uh, this on a on a, a little bit um, more optimistic note, and uh, with uh, next year's uh, summit theme, uh, collaborating for a better world. Um, I would also join in and and hope that we have come at least to a situation where we um, reach out our hands and see if we. We get a deal um, and uh, maybe in an extended period or however, but uh, that we still work in proximity with the UK and the EU together as we should looking to the East and West for the future. Lovely. Well, thank you for the interview, Ellen. And um, we can have a talk about this when we meet in May. Wonderful. We will. Thank you, Karina. Have a lovely day in London. Thank you.